Welcome back to the Nietzsche Podcast for another Q&A. And we're going to start out with some questions from patrons, and then we will do questions from the general public on the Reddit thread. Okay, first, William Kaiser. He says, Hi, Keegan. I'm really enjoying your Birth of Tragedy podcast. It's inspiring me to go back and revisit Schopenhauer, whom I tried to read and gave up. But in research trying to find out who his best translator was, I came across his last work, Wisdom of Life. And I am super impressed both by his words and the translator's rendering. I wonder if you have come across this work. Please let us know what preferred way of understanding Schopenhauer is most efficacious. Uh, He adds, I was basically prejudiced against Schopenhauer because of his neo-Kantianism, his his pessimism, but not his atheism. But his wisdom of life, his last work, redeems him. Thank you, William. Okay. Uh, William, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I actually had a conversation with William on the podcast you can find uh, last season. I completely understand the starting to read Schopenhauer and then giving up, especially if you start with world as will and representation, because it's really dense and uh, somewhat mirthless work, whereas uh, a lot of Schopenhauer's essays are actually... He's actually very witty and... uh, his it has a very like more natural style in his essays. Um, I don't know. Maybe people have different opinions on it, but I find World as Will and Representation a really tough book, and I find Schopenhauer's essays uh, a lot of fun. I have not read Wisdom of Life, so I will have to read it. Maybe I'll talk about it on here. Let us know what preferred way of Schopen- understanding Schopenhauer is most efficacious. Yeah, I mean, I would say... like read through some of his essays um he's got a great uh really funny work called the art of being right which is basically schopenhauer telling you how to argue in bad faith well it's kind of him telling you explaining how bad faith arguments work right but he does it in a way where it's sort of tongue-in-cheek like if you want to completely you know (laughs) <laughs> dominate any discussion and always be right use all of these bad faith tactics and on the other side of that coin here's how to identify all of them so you can flip them back around on people and um i discovered that work very late uh i think somebody actually left it as a comment to um the schopenhauer episode when i posted it on youtube he um he asked me to talk about the art of being right which i'm not going to do a whole episode on it but i guess i'm talking about it here um I mean, because there's not really much to say. Like, you should just go read it. It's 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 quite uh, quite excellent. But um, I mean, the first things I read by him were like, uh, you know, on the suffering of the world, on the indestructibility of being. It's a lot of essay. I mean, you can find very various collections or published editions of his uh, Paralipomena and uh, per- Pergera. I forget what the Latin is. It's basically you know the Latin for his scraps or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I would recommend, uh, getting into it that way first. I don't actually really recommend, I mean, I was about to say, then you can maybe graduate to world as well in representation, but a better preparatory for that would probably be reading Plato and Kant, honestly. And then at that point, um, you know, then you, it all like Plato is one thing, but Kant is like, I, I almost would just say then maybe counterintuitively like maybe don't read some of those works (laughs) like uh because i just you know life is short and you really have to decide what um you know what is really worth your time and um you know kant is and schopenhauer as well his his more rigorous work it's it's so difficult and it I don't know. Um, Maybe that's like anti-intellectual of me from a philosophy podcast, but I try to be real with people about what they're actually going to, you know, enjoy. Right. So I would say his essays are really why, what makes Schopenhauer a good writer, his magnum opus, the ideas in it are, um, they're quite incredible and very important to understand for the purposes of understanding Nietzsche. But, um, you know, that it's, you can you can read about those ideas. You don't have to, you know, do what I did and <laughs> read World as Wool and Representation. Um, because, you know, yeah, if you spend too much time beating your head against that book, um, Schopenhauer might actually convince you 
that life is not worth living um, because it it's such an um, just such a joyless experience. Um, that's not entirely true, but I I've actually picked up that book and not been able to finish it like multiple times, and it wasn't until um, a few years ago that I really was able to get through it. So, um, essays thumbs up. World is well in representation. I give it a thumbs down as a reading experience, not the ideas. Okay. Um, William Hogan says, I'm curious about Nietzsche's views on human sexuality. I have a theory that's premised on the idea that until humanity is able to deal with its sexuality openly, honestly, and collective collectively and all its polymorphic perversity, as Freud put it without shame or taboo, we are doomed. Sex equals life. It's therefore the most beautiful thing from Nietzschean perspective, right? Christianity is hostile towards it, with St. Augustine's hateful, incestuous self-loathing being largely responsible for Western religious taboos regarding it. Muhammad was no fan of free love either, and if you want to quickly assess the freedom and humanity of a given culture or gender equality, look no further than its laws regarding pornography and prostitution and adultery. They have an inversely proportional, proportional relationship. Uh, and then he links an article. I'll, I'll go ahead and put it in the, the, the show notes. It's say it says a basic rundown of St. Augustine's perverse take on human sexuality. Uh, here's a paragraph quoted from the article. Quote, the boy was named Augustine, and he went on to shape Christian theology for both Roman Catholics and Protestants to explore the hidden recesses of the inner life and to bequeath to all of us the conviction that there's something fundamentally damaged about the entire human species. There's probably been no more important Western thinker the past 1500 years, end quote. Um, that's certainly true regarding Augustine. And I often try to point out to people that this is also in Paul. I mean, a lot of the really, um, what would you say? Um, the, the doctrines that people probably find most objectionable about Christianity, you can source to Paul, um, you know, just within the Bible it's, itself. So it's it's not just a matter of interpretation. There is an anti-sex um, morality of the Bible in the New Testament. Um, and it, it is um, very much against sex as anything other than a necessary evil to be contained within marriage um, and, you know, just used for reproduction. I, ca- I can't really imagine why that would be even, I mean, that's the thing is that St. Paul actually says it's, that's not even a good thing. It is a necessary evil, but it's better to marry than to burn. Like the best thing is to be celibate, but if you can't be celibate, then get married and only have sex within the confines of a Christian marriage and all of the rules regarding that. But, uh, so it is like, it kind of completely goes against, um, you know, Noah's, uh, declaration to, to be f- fruitful and multiply, uh, right after the flood. Right. Um, because <laughs> in the new Testament, it's, uh, I mean, it, and that sort of, I think would point to Nietzsche's whole critique of the biblical morality and how the old Testament actually has, um, uh, is more related to like the master morality than the, uh, than it is to the morality of the New Testament um, in many respects. But that, I guess, brings us a little bit off the track. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, you can go read that article, but we take it for granted that Christianity is hostile to sexuality. Um, and, you know, Islam, yeah, Islam in general is as well. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, in extremely Christian societies, pornography, prostitution, and adultery would be um, you know, legally prescribed just as they are under Sharia. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I see the point that you're making here. Um, I think though, hmm. So you say deal with, uh, its sexuality openly on and honestly and collectively. I'm wondering exactly what that would entail because I feel that on some level, Western civilization has been on the same page there in terms of like the direction that we're heading. It's very difficult for me to see given the, um, you know, the trans, the transition that occurred in the sexual morality post world war two to not see how there's been a massive transformation and that that's sort of the direction that we're, we're heading. 
I mean, I remember in Robert Piercig's uh, book, Leela, he, you know, he, one of his big points in that book is that the rebellion of the sort of free spirited hippie morality against the Victorian morality was already like a failure on their part to realize that the Victorian morality was already a thing of the past by their own time. That uh, really a sort of like analytical, um, modern, post-industrial mindset had already taken hold among the intelligentsia and the cultural tastemakers of society. I mean, like uh, one of the things that um, Curtis uh, Yarvin often um, points out is that everyone cool in the 1930s in America was a Marxist, you know, um, everyone among the, you know, intelligentsia. And that um, we already had kind of moved on from the, that the 19th century was actually fairly tumultuous in terms of like the debates that were um, already going on and the, you know, discovery of evolution. I mean, Nietzsche is writing about, you know, this sort of tumultuous cultural time and that the Victorian morality had already kind of been shaken and overthrown. Um, and so I don't know, I would, I guess I would ask the question rather than giving you like a straight answer, <laughs> which is sort of my habit. I would ask a series of questions that I think we all should think about. Like what are the, the taboos around sex that remain today? Like where do people feel shame about sex? I think, feel like my intuition tells me that to the extent that shame exists around sex, there's some degree that seems to be like maybe normal, like sort of like around any, there's a lot of natural bodily functions, right? That we don't necessarily want to like um, talk about openly or do openly. And so that there might always be like a sense of like embarrassment that can turn into like weird pathological feelings, especially if people have like, you know, if they're getting raised in a religious family or, you know, are having sources of uh, shame, you know, imparted or taboo imparted to them. But I would just sort of say that when I look at society at large, it seems like it's increasingly the case that there are no like collective like taboos placed on sexuality, really. Um, that that's sort of the promise of liberal democracy, right? Is um, individual freedom and privacy and whatever you do by yourself, that doesn't bother me. That's fine. And I, I would say that's sort of the sentiment I heard growing up from like everybody, regardless of their political affiliation or cultural background. I, I'm again, I'm just speaking about America. I don't know about the rest of the world. Um, but you know, in any case, it seems like, I don't know. So what exactly, I mean, so I guess, I guess I'm just saying God is dead, right? <laughs> like I basically do believe that that Christian morality has died and that, um, to the extent that we do still carry on that, uh, those taboos, they're sort of dying out and, or it's a self-imposed shame or, um, yeah. But the direction is clear, the di the direction that we're going in. So then the question would be, if I'm, so the first question is, where do those taboos still exist or where do you see those taboos? Maybe new ones are being created that are, are of a non-Christian or post-Christian um, coming from that sort of framework. Then the other question would be like, what should we expect? Um, what, how would we, what would that look like human beings dealing with our sexuality openly, honestly, and collectively? And all its polymorphic perversity, and also, I mean, the the because of Freud is brought up, and that's a Freudian term. I mean, hmm. I mean, to me, that just sort of raises the question because I mean, Freud's um, whole thesis regarding human sexuality was that the suppression of it would cause the sexual impulse to be sublimated into other forms, and that therefore behaviors that people. Um, Behaviors that people carry out in their day-to-day -day life uh, that may be pathological or harmful to themselves or others or self-undermining or any number of things, um, all of these pathologies that people might manifest are, in fact, due to sexual repression. And um, poly... What, what is it again? Um, 
polymorphic perversity, I believe was um, him talking about people getting sexual gratification um, from behavior which is not um, like in the social norm. And, you know, uh, like alternative sexual practices, we might say, to just keep it <laughs> PG. But, you know, um, Freud thought that that was, again, from people having like experiences in childhood or being, you know, um, somehow coming to associate the sexual like urge with something that was not normally part of sex. And so, again, in all of Freud's theories, the reason why I sort of bring it up is because he thinks these are all like the damage that society or civilization has done to us in some way or another, or that our upbringing, right. Or experiences that we've had. And that by becoming free of that, we could then manifest a healthy relationship towards sex. Now, the interesting thing about that is like, I guess that's why I have questions about this of like, what that, what does that look like to deal with our sexuality openly, honestly, and collectively as you're putting it, because those are all sort of positive things. But I always get the impression with Freud that he would like his picture of what a healthy sexual life would be, would be one that actually matches like the normative rules of society. Right. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but if you can correct me, but he still has his view of like a normal sort of sexuality. Right. So like, what does that look like? So I guess I'm just wondering like, where are we trying to get, where are we trying to get from where we are here? Um, that would be better than the current engagement with sex that society has, I guess. Because to me, it does seem sort of like an individual thing. Like, um, you know, Freud is a psychoanalyst and he's concerned with like individual pathologies, even though he did make these commentaries on all of society. And um, I sort of feel like in the situation we're in because it's going to so, so much of the shame and taboo that actually exists, unless you actually live under like Sharia law here in America, you can do whatever you want. So <laughs> isn't that your own battle to fight is sort of, I guess what I'm, what I would say. Um, and like my final question would be like, maybe you would think from what Freud was saying that the more liberal a society becomes towards its sexual mores, like the less, alternative sexual practices and extreme sexual like uh, fetishes and like, you know, deviant sexual behavior, whatever that might be, the more that that would, um, or the less that that would occur or the less that people would have a need to like express themselves pathologically, express the sexual impulse pathologically and not in a quote unquote normal way. But, um, is that actually what we see? Because I don't know if it is, there's like a huge problem with like pornography addiction. Um, and I mean, a lot of young people sort of report like a lack of um, like enthusiasm for dating and having relationships and how the like being treated like a piece of meat on Tinder where people just swipe one direction or the other based on a picture, a photo of, you, of the goods, you know, it's like I can see I'm, I'm really glad I'm not dating now because I could see how that might depress people. Um so I, I don't know. I've actually like on the other side of it, I've heard a lot of complaints from like the zoomer generation that they don't actually like sort of the sexual environment we're in. And it doesn't really have to do with shame and taboos. Um, you could point the finger at a lot of things, you know, the, the conservatives would say like libertinism, the, the left might say the problem is the commodification of sex and capitalism. Um, and, uh, I would say it's probably some combination of the two. Um, that being said, I think you raise, I think maybe to bring it back to a Nietzschean, because you, you asked me actually about Nietzsche's views, um, on human sexuality. Um, you know, I, I really think he, he would have advocated for a, probably a different sexual morality for like aristocratic or free spirited people than for the common person that just as he mentions, you know, in human alti human, a ruler, perhaps, promoting the traditional religion and its morality in order to keep control over the social order. The other side of that coin is just like the Greek aristocrats that, you know, he admired, um, you know, the aristocracy, um, maybe they can be trusted to, you know, live whatever individual sexual lives that they, they feel like. 
Um, you know, and the Greeks notably were, you know, often had like homosexual sexual relations as well. Um, but you know, so that's sort of what I think. I mean, he, he also made some kind of, um, disturbing comments about how marriage is like a degeneration from concubinage and that concubinage is like a more natural state of affairs. Um, because, and I remember there's another line where he said, it's the most natural thing in the world for a man to have many sexual partners. Um, I, I, I find those lines disturbing just because I know that Nietzsche didn't, wasn't a man like that. And that, um, we don't really know if he had any sexual partners. I mean, people talk about him visiting brothels. Um, you know, there's a story of him being turned down by Lou Salome or, which is really just a story. We don't know if it's true. Um, I've seen some evidence recently that it might be true, but I've seen more evidence that it isn't. So I, just withholding judgment on that. Um, but uh, on the other hand, you know, he, he did know other women in his life. And I mean, who knows? We don't know every last detail of the man's life. Um, we should not We should be more agnostic about certain things, but we don't really know either way. Um, but he definitely was not a ladies' man. We know that. And it reading passages like that makes me think that Nietzsche was projecting some sort of fantasy of being like a dominating barbarian aristocrat who could, you know, have sexual license and knowing that he wasn't a man like that. It, it disturbs me for that reason, because it, it like kind of confirms all the worst things about Nietzsche and makes you wonder if maybe he was like a chronic masturbator, like Wagner, uh, alleged. Right. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if, I, I mean, certainly Nietzsche didn't agree with the Christian shame around sex. Yes. That I don't, maybe I haven't sufficiently emphasized that because I think it's rather obvious. And I think he thought the, the pagans did have a healthier view of sex, but I don't know how you go back to that. Um, you don't just go back, right? That That's sort of the problem. You don't just go back. We have already had that Christian shame introduced to us. And so um, really it has to die away. And that's um, that's something that is the death of God is going to affect the free spirit differently from like the common person. Everyone has to sort of fight that battle where they are. Um, so again, maybe not as helpful of an answer as you might like, but it's a, you know, it's a big topic. All right, let's go to the Reddit questions. Oh wait, I had one more. Uh, I had, um, a question from another patron. Um, he sent me a, question about uh zizek's christian atheism uh he said yeah what do you think of zizek's concept of christian atheism and i had to actually ask him to send me a video and so i'll uh link the video in the description uh i'll give you a short um i guess really this this to me is the most important aspect is that zizek uh brings up the moment where jesus um while he's on the cross, uh, says, Father, why have you forsaken me? And interprets this in the spirit of contemporaries of C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, as being a moment when God himself was an atheist. So when Jesus asks, Father, why have you abandoned me? He uh, actually experiences, as God in human form, actually experiences doubt in the belief in God. And thus, because Jesus' whole thing, right, is that it's God emptying into a form of man, you know, uh, God thinking, uh, uh, what was it, thinking that uh, his uh, immortality, not a thing to be held on to, emptied himself and entered the form of a man and became obedient unto death. I forget exactly how the passage in the Bible goes. But, um, and so Jesus becomes, he, he, he's supposed to be able to have actually like lived and suffered as a human lived and suffered. And the way humans live and suffer isn't just, you know, being, you know, torn apart by, uh, you know, like when we inevitably die, having our, our physical form rent asunder, uh, in whatever way that happens. Uh, it's also psychological and doubt and existential. And, So in that moment, Jesus experiences that doubt. And so 
I think what where Zizek's coming from here, because he basically says the the only way he believes that the only way that atheism could have ever been arrived at was actually through Christianity, and that I think he's getting this from the fact that Chesterton says that if you look um, to all the world's religions, you will not find, or maybe it was actually Zizek himself who said it. Maybe I'm just getting it confused. But in either way, the claim is made that you look through all the world's religions, you will not find one other than Christianity where a god doubts the existence of God. Um, and I think I often criticize religions with their claims of their uniqueness, but they may potentially be correct about that. Um, nevertheless, Zizek postulates from this that um, there is a sort of Christian character to athe- atheism, to a genuine atheism. And I would uh, I would also remind uh I think maybe a, a, a clearer way of explaining what I think Zizek is getting at with the kind of atheism that he's talking about was uh, put forward by Alan Watts in what he called uh, atheism in the name of God. And where Watts was coming from as he explained it, because Watts will, of course, make reference to all these like Brahmanic religious claims and the Buddhist doctrines and even Christian mysticism to sort of demonstrate to the audience that if you're going to give an image of like the supreme reality of everything, like the entire universe, you're going to personify that the majesty of everything, which is so beyond the human mind, uh, so infinitely beyond the human mind to understand. And you're going to personify that into a being Um, that in some sense, no word or description can ever work. That's why Maimonides, his, um, via negativa is uh his apophatic method is so interesting because he will um he basically um makes all these statements about god but they're all in the negative um it's uh, probably too much to go into here right but um it's sort of like saying you know I'll, let me pull up some maimonides okay so um Here we have a quote from Maimonides, quote, God is not soul or mind, nor does it possess imagination, conviction, speech, or understanding. It cannot be spoken of and cannot be grasped by understanding. It is not number or order, greatness or smallness, quality or inequality, similarity or dissimilarity. It is not immovable, moving, or at rest. It does not live, nor is it life. It is not substance, nor is it eternity or time. There is no speaking of it, nor name, nor knowledge of it. Darkness and light, error and truth, it is none of these. It is beyond assertion and denial. End quote. So that's not normally how you hear God praised, but um, that is Maimonides' intention. I had a friend explain it to me like this, where he was saying that, you know, if all of our words come up short for describing God, it's sort of like saying, um, you know, it's like the, the king who possesses the most gold in all the land to go up and praise him by saying, well, he has a lot of silver even if it might be kind of true from one perspective that he has, well, yeah, he does have silver. That's that's true. But uh, you can't speak of the thing for which you can't actually qualitatively describe God in any way that actually makes sense because all of the labels that you're fixing to them with your limited human conception of them in some sense are transcended by God. It always escapes. It's always bigger than the idea or the box you're trying to put around God. And that's what Maimonides is saying. Um, And, so similarly, Alan Watts, coming from the Zen tradition, believes very similarly that the Buddha or the Godhead or Brahman or whatever might be like the essence of reality as such, this thing that is, um, you know, in Watts' belief, similar to Schopenhauer, coterminous with all time and space and all beings in it, and that of which we are only a manifestation or a reflection. And that we're inseparably part of, indivisibly part of. And so um, it's sort of this like transcendent idealism in some sense, not transcendental idealism, but um, <laughs> in the Kantian sense. But I, in any case, um, so no word can really um, encapsulate it. Even all those words that we've just given to it. God, what do you think of when I say God? B- Buddha, what do you think of? Uh, Brahman, they all have like a cultural connotation that, or they have some sort of imagery or um, you think of some sort of set of religious 
belief or um, institutions or um, a certain aesthetic, or you just have all these mind pictures that associate with um, whatever term that we want to use for the transcendent absolute reality. And none of them, if we're, if we actually are going to do, to be honest about talking about something that you would call God, it, none of them measure up. They cannot describe such a thing. And so Watts, um, idea for how he designates himself as, as an atheist in the name of God, that, um, this, whatever this, um, great thing is, it is so beyond me that all the words that I put on it, um, just seem like nonsense. Um, it was actually, uh, one of those, uh, uh, Christian writers, Thomas Aquinas, uh, who after, you know, like writing a great deal on, um, theology considered to be like a ama- you know, monumental works, um, after, you know, towards the end of his life, um, after having a series of mystical experiences, he said, all that I have written appears to be, uh, as so much straw after the things that I now know. Um, so it, or like, you know, I, I, could, I, I shall write no more because all I have written seems like straw, whatever he, the complete quote is, I don't remember, but, um, that's a rather common sentiment. And, and again, you not, you know, not only find it in the East, but you find it just a much as much among Meister Eckhart or Western figures as well. Um, and so to go back to Zizek's Christian atheism, I can understand how, um, you could see in the example of Jesus, maybe I'll bring in yet another, um, <laughs> writer outside of Zizek and uh, into this whole mix to, to illustrate the point is R- René Girard, who ba- basically believes that all of human society um, prior to Christianity was based on um, collective sacrifice, scapegoating, right? Scapegoating a um, an innocent individual, right? And that we see this in the Old Testament. I mean, it's the story of the Bible, right? That um, you have to make sacrifices to appease God. The animal didn't do anything wrong. In fact, that's the whole point, because it's because it did no wrong that it can suffer for the wrongs that you've done, right? You take something innocent to cast off your sin onto, and the collective does violence against it and punishes something innocent so that the collective can continue to maintain cohesion, that this is a method of maintaining social cohesion. And that Christianity, in a perhaps unconscious psychological sense, in the New Testament, it's a revelation to mankind that the scapegoat is innocent. That's the first story where um, the scapegoat it, it's, you know, you see from the perspective of the scapegoat, not only is he innocent, he is perfectly innocent. He's the most innocent. Um, you know, it's God himself. And so it proclaims the innocence of the victim of the collective violence that's been used, you know, just using that person instrumentally in order to maintain the social order. Um, there are a lot of very interesting things we could say about this from a Nietzschean perspective. And in fact, Gerard's interpretation of Nietzsche was more or less that Nietzsche actually understood this, but um, he wished to, that he saw how Christianity's ending of the, because what this does over a period of two millennia it, by bringing this into human consciousness is it ends the community's ability to continue persecuting the innocent scapegoats, right? Um, and so we stop that process of this collective violence which rejuvenates the community. And uh, Gerard's sort of interpretation of Nietzsche is that he looks back to the pagans uh, and that capacity to use that engage in violence to rejuvenate the community and wishes to regain that, um, which Gerard rejects on moral grounds. So in any case, um, I think so. Yeah, like it. What Zizek's saying is actually very profound that Christianity I guess in a similar way, analogous to what Gerard's saying, that Christianity revealed, just as it revealed to the community that the scapegoat is innocent, what he's, Zizek saying following Chesterton is Jesus reveals doubt um, in the deepest questions, like 
the, or the, rather the, the answers that our religions have given us and the stories that we've been told and the faith that we were supposed to hold um, on the end of Jesus living as a human individual, emptying himself of his, you know, being all knowing. Um, uh, oh, the line was thinking not equality with God to be a thing to be held on to. Yeah. Became obedient unto death. Anyway, just remembering that line. So um, yeah, Jesus is then capable of doubting just as he's capable of dying. So he's capable of, you know, mortality and he's capable of atheism. And so through that revelation, just in the same way that it doesn't happen overnight, but over 2000 years, it impresses itself into the psyche that, um, we can all sort of see this image of a person who is like us that can, um, sort of show us that it is a godly thing to doubt. It also sort of reminds me of the Faust, maybe perhaps Goethe's uh, point in Faust, that uh, it is, um, that he redeems the man who is an ever-striving, uh, restless, uh, you know, ever-ambitious man who throws himself into life, even though he commits every impiety and sells his soul to the devil and acts immorally in the course of doing it. That, uh, Faust is redeemed by Goethe, and so atheism is redeemed by Jesus. And uh, so that's what makes atheism possible, and the degree to which you're a genuine atheist today, it's not like a lifestyle choice or, um, you know, like like a dogmatic belief or, you know, being rebellious, to the extent that it's actually um, a deep-seated doubt in everything that we've been told about the deepest questions of the world and um, basically being <laughs> just thrust into the midst of everything and just in free fall of like, I have no idea what this existence and what this reality is and whether there is, you know, anything looking after me or any of that. Right. Right that uh, that image of that is provided for us in the figure of Jesus, perhaps first in world literature. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my comment on that. Um, moving now to the Reddit questions. Uh, greetings. This is local P thief. Greetings. I am a longtime listener of your great podcast yet never asked a question before. So here it goes. What do you think about Carl Jung in reference to Nietzsche? Um, uh, and he just says, on another note, I thank you for helping me understand Nietzsche in theory in a clear and detailed way. Thank you. Okay, so Carl Jung. Um, I really love Carl Jung's writings. Um, I've only mentioned him in passing, I think, but uh, I actually have not read his analysis of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. I've read excerpts from it, but I haven't like read the whole thing. Um, and... I don't know if I like Carl Jung's interpretation of Nietzsche because you asked in reference to Nietzsche, right? Um, like I like Carl Jung a great deal as his own thinker, but in his interpretation of Nietzsche, he, um, Oh, I've also like, I, again, I haven't read the whole thing. Um, I don't think many people have, but I've like leafed through the red book a little bit and I've seen how like some, some of Nietzsche's names and, characters like pop up in that book so i think nietzsche really got worked his way into jung's um unconscious nietzsche really like messes with people man <laughs> doesn't he but uh and they always have to that's the thing is like there are there's some people like Rene gerard where he really sees the value in christianity and i actually enjoy his his interpretation of nietzsche um, but a lot of people who have like sort of an opposite world um, interpretation than Nietzsche does. And I think Jung is one of those who's really not, that's the thing, like morally speaking, metaphysically speaking, Jung is like the opposite of a Nietzschean in, in many respects. And like, I guess what I would say is like, good for Jung. Like, you know, uh, you should, you do a great job of building your own, uh, philosophical, psychological, spiritual edifices or whatever you want to call it. Um, but whenever I find, I, I find a lot of philosophers who are otherwise brilliant, who find themselves in opposition to Nietzsche, it's like they recognize the power in his work when they read it and they 
think uh, it, and they think I have to address this or integrate this into my philosophy. And it's like, no, you should leave it alone. <laughs> um, that's sort of the impression I get. I mean, uh, the easiest there, I mean, uh, just a couple comments. Like, uh, I don't think Carl Jung's statements that Nietzsche over identified that Nietzsche is an example of like psychosis brought on by like archetypal self identification with Dionysus. Um, and the reason why I don't think that is because, um, Nietzsche had a brain disease, right? Like he, Nietzsche's condition was physiological. And when you look at the medical records, you realize it's like, oh, he suffered with this his entire life from the time he was a child. It probably is what killed his brother and his father, which means it's congenital. And he, there were signs of it that he himself was aware of and wrote about and told his friends about and like told his friend, uh, Reza Schoenhofer, where he was like, told him about how when he closed his eyes, he could see all these visual phosphines. Like he didn't use that term, but, uh, just in the letter, you know, Reza was like, that said that Nietzsche like had like a, a, um, like a note of, of disturbed, like, um, you know, like just a disturbed tone to his, his unusually calm voice. As he said, don't you think it's a sign of incipient madness where he was like, aware that he was going to like lose his mind and die painfully. And so, yeah, like did his work or not his work, but some of his correspondences and personal writings become a little bit erratic toward the end of 1888 and the beginning of 1889. Could that maybe be like in that vulnerable position? He suffered from archetype, you know, over identification. I mean, maybe, but, it's like it's clear to me like what actually happened is his condition deteriorated whether it was a tumor or catacill or whatever and that's what drove him insane and did him in that it's not i think it i think it's somebody like jung sees this example of nietzsche of a brilliant man who sort of dares to defy the you know religious metaphysical structure of the world and, um, you know, he's punished for it in some sense. It's like a morality tale. And I don't think that's necessarily consciously Jung's intention. I'm psychoanalyzing Jung. But it fits in perfectly with his whole worldview to look at Nietzsche the way he does. That it's like his madness is a consequence of his ideas. And I don't think that's true. I think what one of the things I've learned from Nietzsche is look at the psychological or sorry, the physiological cause of one's psychological reality, um, at least first and foremost as the foundation. And we look at, when we look at the physiological cause in Nietzsche, it's very clear that this was, I mean, in some sense, it's, it's funny because Nietzsche talked about eugenics in some places. There's the, the infamous passage in, uh, I think it's in daybreak where, he, he relates a parable of a deformed child being brought to a priest and the priest says, uh, kill it. And when everyone sort of, <laughs> all the villagers are like, what? And they reproach the preach for, priest for his cruelty. He says, but isn't it crueler to let it live? Um, and, you know, Nietzsche's echoing a, a view that would not have been radical among the Dorians, among the, the Spartan civilization. Infanticide was probably even practiced at Athens, um, to some extent, um, Plato advocates for it in the Republic, but you know, um, so Nietzsche, you know, it's like sort of the physiological consequence of his, um, all of his rhetoric on making, you know, being life ascending and like the weak and ill constituted shall perish and we should even help them to do so. Well, Nietzsche was ill constituted his, in his very genome. And, um, so it's, it, it, and yet he fought against it. And, um, actually my friend, Andre Georgescu, I'm realizing now, as I'm like saying this, that I'm like, kind of was probably influenced by an essay of his that I read where he sort of wrote about this because it is true. And he made me think about it in a way maybe that I hadn't before that, um, Nietzsche does sort of refute his own ideas by that token that he lived as a deformed sort of uh 
ill-constituted, uh, sickly person. But it was the strength of his ideas that echoed through the ages. So that's like a re re rebuke to his whole ideology. On the other hand, I think uh, Nietzsche's Nietzsche's philosophy all, is also helpful, though, for staving off the sort of like Jungian idea. And maybe I, I've also heard it from some other places that Nietzsche like suffered from some sort of psychological condition brought on by his philosophy his philosophy drove him mad right i don't think we should be th taking that seriously um okay next question is from being in there he says as a nietzsche reader what kind of ideological view nietzsche would endorse to overcome this late uh, capitalism state ideology we know that nietzsche is kind of future philosopher who always want to overcome this typical status quo ideology, while most of philosopher nowadays seems skeptical and cynical to any solutions. Is Nietzsche's ideas still relevant to overcome capitalism in larger scale? Thank you, and sorry for my grammar, my bad English. Uh, no problem. I think I get what you're asking. Um, Nietzsche, I mean, we are going to get into Nietzschean politics, but it's I, I feel like I always have to say this, that it's Nietzsche doesn't really lay out a political program or a policy agenda. Um, and he doesn't ever talk about a way to attain any sort of political goals because Nietzsche, I think was, would have preferred to achieve his political goals by, um, trying to transform the culture. I think that's sort of the point of a lot of his philosophy is to affect a cultural revaluation, a moral revaluation, and that this will have a downstream effect on politics. Um, now, it's funny because that is sort of contrary to, say, the Marxist view that it's like material conditions. It's basically that culture is downstream of politics is sort of the Marxist view that the political material reality um, shapes what the consciousness of the subject will be, right? And Nietzsche himself, again, would seem to be against the idea that you could really alter society in some way through intellectual or moral arguments, right? But that's not Nietzsche doesn't intend to do it dialectically and he doesn't intend to appeal to the masses to, you know, create some ideal social arrangement out of their free will. He's very much inspired by the Epicurean notion of the obscure life. And I think this has to do with his early study of the poet Theogenes. Theogenes was a um, aristocrat who lived in a, a Greek city-state called Megara. And during this period of democratic upheavals, basically the aristocracy that he was a part of uh, was dispossessed from their power, they were overthrown, and the common people um, established a uh, democratic government, right? Or, or I think the first thing that happened was a tyrant overthrew, a single autocratic leader overthrew the aristocracy. And then uh, the aristocracy returned, and then there was another democratic revolution, and they, they was banished. Uh, basically, there was there were repeated attempts. There was a back and forth between the nobility and the common people, and eventually the democratization of the city won over. But uh, so Theogenes is one of these aristocrats, and he basically what Nietzsche sees in him, and he writes about this in his um, early essays on Theogenes was that uh, Theogenes had to turn inward and could no longer basically partake of the old martial noble uh, virtues of the aristocracy, but had to have a sort of inner nobility. And that, you know, he then found uh, Cyrnus, who he like took on as his pupil and tried to mentor him with, uh, you know, the aristocratic ethos so that when the time was right, Cyrnus could uh, recreate the aristocracy anew. I think something like that is Nietzsche's idea of a bunch of <laughs> philosophers, um, because Nietzsche, in his later works, thinks the 
the new aristocracy will have a philosophical element to it. So it'll be philosophical men who will go off into an Epicurean obscurity, um, you know, and sort of have a fraternal associations where they will collectively nurture this new ethos, which is um, aristocratic in nature, and that it'll be a few great individuals who will lay out his political program, and that he de- therefore does not have to give them a political program or a suite of policy issues, because he doesn't believe that he could give them universal, timeless, ahistorical instructions on what they should do in a given situation. Um, and I think the oldest question really in political philosophy is actually who should rule. And over the years, we've eventually come to this very odd idea that is a product product of modernity. Well, it's not a product of modernity, actually, because you see it as early as Plato's Republic. It's the dominating idea of modernity, though, that the relevant political question is by what system shall we be governed? Um, And we act as if the system has a life of its own. Now, of course it does, but there are always humans in the plugged into the nodes of the system, right? And it's always going to be subject to the faults and frailties of the humans within it. And that's what, you know, any system you come up with, right? You can, if you, (laughs) you can attack it on the basis of what if the people are no good? I mean, the easy one is monarchy, right? Oh, you think the solution is a king? Well, what if that king goes crazy? Okay. Well, you think the solution is democracy? What if the people are polarized, undereducated? What if they hate each other? What if they um, are ignorant of history? What if they vote based on partisan affiliation and more based on like fear and are easily manipulable by, um, you know, like, partisan and uh like dogmatic uh apparatuses of media and uh you know like what if their focus is always short term and self-centered rather than you know like vision for the future and over long generations what if you find yourself in that situation like we are right now you know it's like the question is always who should rule and how do you ensure that you have Um, good people in positions of rulership making the decisions and executing them. Uh, That is always the question is, how do you produce that? Um, We have this odd bias that we will come up with some sort of system for doing things that will overcome all of the frailties of humanity, even though it's run by humanity. Um, It's very odd. But so... To overcome late late capitalism state ideology, I mean, I, th- I would agree, okay, the Marxists are right to some extent that capitalism has internal contradictions that will have to be resolved in some way or another. And those contradictions will drive it forward. And uh, frankly, the condition that we're in now or the, the type of system that we're living in now, I don't think is properly described by capitalism or socialism. I think elements of both have coalesced into something which is has transcended both of them and that we are in a sort of technocratically managed it's a managerial society right bureaucratic managerial society um and that i think will either turn into like a sort of like neo-technocratic feudalism uh, or some sort of like violent upheaval from below or like a tyrant or Caesar figure um, emerges to like smash or interrupt that. Um, and I would say history would indicate something will arise to smash and interrupt that. And I think that's what Nietzsche points to is that um, there is the cyclical pattern of politics, nothing lasts forever. And that eventually like that basically our society is going to have to endure a, a great deal of hardship and cataclysm in order for us, for it to be possible for us to transform it and turn things around. And that the most likely thing to happen is that everything just kind of goes to shit. Um, And, you know, it doesn't mean 
you know, the apocalypse, like Spain used to be a great empire that held the world's reserve currency and had colonies all over the world, but, <laughs> but, uh, they're not anymore. Um, okay. I don't know if that answers your question really, but I, so Nietzsche doesn't give us any prescriptions for how to like overcome this current, uh, ideology. What he would say is great people need to foster a noble ethos, um, amongst themselves and wait for the opportune moment based on the historical patterns of history and then do what you will according to like the project of the values that you want to legislate. There's your answer. Okay. Uh, what alternative uh, it's, this is Duras Garpello. He asks, what alternative wording would you give to will to power in discussions with people that are not very familiar about Nietzschean ideas? I found the term will to power to be almost repellent due to the immediate superficial interpretation taken at face value that it simply means power in the vulgar common sense of the word. And of course, a lengthy explanation would attribute proper meaning to it. However, it still seems hard for people to grasp the idea, even with explanations. So I'd like to know if there would be an alternative wording for will to power or will to potency. I understand this has been discussed before in the podcast to some extent, but I couldn't quite find a satisfactory answer. It may not be a substitute term. Perhaps it's lazy to want a more palatable version of the term, but I'd like to see your take on it. Um, hmm. I mean, my first answer would be like, don't, don't, uh, <laughs> don't like go around talking about will to power to people. Um, because there's really not, um, yeah, like it's going to sound strange and it's hard to explain and like, what's the point? But, uh, I would say rather than trying to find some pithy term for it, I would say to just try your best to not to explain the concept without making reference to jargon to the best of your ability. If you really want to communicate this to people who are not familiar with Nietzschean ideas, I'm guessing these are just non-philosophical people in general. Um, like learn how to explain things without um, just saying, well, Nietzsche believed that everything was will to power and because when you say that sentence, right, you've just made the will to power into like a, this mysterious X, right? That is like this now, this mystical thing. It makes Nietzsche sound like he's um, positing some sort of Brahmanic, like underlying, you know, like in a Schopenhauerian sense, will to power beneath everything. I mean, the thing is in his notebooks, maybe that is kind of what he thinks at times, but that's not really the most... Um, the easiest way to explain the concept to people. Um, the best way to explain it would uh, be to say that um, Nietzsche didn't believe that um, Nietzsche believed that life was not about self-preservation, but about um, expanding and growing and transcending, overcoming. That Nietzsche thought life was not uh, about being in the same form forever and trying to make yourself safe and comfortable. He thought life was about um, trying to give rise to something greater that can sometimes involve doing dangerous things, taking risks, and even sacrifice up to and including sacrifice of your life. Um, and I would probably say uh, if you really want to explain some of the psychological aspects to just explain to them that weakness corrupts, that Nietzsche rejects Lord Acton's famous saying that absolute power corrupts absolutely um, and says that actually no um, it's people who are not in a position of power who become bitter and hateful and vindictive and often people who are who are in a position of power are actually ennobled by it and that the problem comes when people who have been been made <laughs> been made worse by being uh oppressed and persecuted then take the reins of power and what is the first thing they do with it they <laughs> express all of their their inner weakness and um desire for revenge right they manifest that because that's what they what they are and what they've become but the idea that power is just inherently bad it's so english it's so fucking English. And we all, it's like a truism and it's not true that everyone says, well, power corrupts. Nietzsche doesn't believe that at all. 
And I would say that's a, a fun thing. That's a fun formulation to challenge people with because of course they'll disagree because they've heard that power corrupts. What? No, it's a truism, like, right? It has to be true. Um, but find ways to prod people and get them to think about it. I mean, a lot of what Nietzsche does in some of his most effective works is just ask dangerous questions. Uh, and so it also helps if you want to communicate these ideas to pose it in the form of a question. And because if it's sufficient, if it's a sufficiently interesting question, people will ask them, ask it to themselves, whether or not they, you know, actually follow through with you in the moment. If you raise a sufficiently interesting question, people will ask it. So, um, I don't know if I have a better formula for you. Um, you know, uh, you could call it, just say he has a life affirming philosophy and he believes we should love our fate <laughs> and that life is about struggle. Qu quote them Heraclitus saying, uh, war is the father of all. It has made some men, uh, gods and some, it has made some gods and some men, some slaves and some free, uh, uh, what is it? Um, strife is universal and, um, yeah. Okay. This is from Opera Unortho, and the O's are zeros. He says, while Nietzsche didn't advocate for any ideology to my knowledge, my reading and understanding of his work was that a figure that our for yourself approach, I think he means your for yourself approach. What? Uh, like Frank Herbert's Dune. Would you say this interpretation is accurate? I'm sorry, wait, I'm going to read this again. This is very strangely worded. Nietzsche didn't advocate for any ideology to my knowledge. Okay. My reading and understanding of his work was a figure that our for yourself approach. Figure that out for yourself. Okay, that's what it... <sighs> watch that autocorrect. Um, figure, figure that out for yourself approach like Frank Herbert's Dune. Would you say this interpretation is accurate? Um... I mean, I don't know what you mean by Frank Herbert's Dune. I mean, if you read God Emperor of Dune, it definitely seems like uh, I've heard Kantbot suggest that that uh, that Stalin was like uh, Paul Atreides, um, you know, becoming the not Paul Atreides. I think it's his descent. I forget who it is. Um, you know, becoming the God Emperor of Dune and setting his people on the uh, the golden path. Uh, because he can like foresee all the different like visions of the future and basically knows like, all right, I'm going to have to break a few eggs to make this omelet. But, you know, like, like Dr. Strange and in game seeing the one path that uh, would be the best outcome for all humanity. I'm going to do all these things and it's going to lead to like death and jihads and all this shit. But in the end, it's going to work out right because I have the, the foresight. Right. Uh, that seems to me like Frank Herbert is advocating for a philosopher King. Um, which would not actually be uncommon among sci-fi writers. I found a lot of strange um, libertarian and even monarchist sentiments among sci-fi writers, as well as the other side of that coin, like socialist and, and uh, like collectivist ideas, which is what I love about sci-fi because, um, you know, the, the, the extremes of political philosophy are really, are really where it's at. Let's be honest. That's what, that's what we enjoy. Like John Stuart Mill. I mean, you, or uh or adam smith you read that stuff now and you're just like oh my god like it's so it just seems so naive right um so but i would say figure it out for yourself i mean like that's every work of fiction ever written and uh to at least to some extent uh you, you know you can always say that like you everything's open to interpretation at the same time there is textual evidence and there is an actual content of the work that you have to ground your interpretation in. And so uh, Nietzsche didn't advocate for any ideology. Well, I mean, like he did to the extent of advocating for the Dionysian ideology, I would say. So yeah, um, take that for what you will. Uh, Titus X asks, in his short story, The Rat, Polish avant-garde writer, Vitold Grombowitz, who was greatly influenced by Nietzsche, provides an interesting counter-argument towards the Nietzschean concept of the overman. He portrays the said overman as the hooligan, a strong brute unbounded by anything. Against all odds, a former judge, Skorabkowski, 
Annoyed by his terror over the land, manages to capture him. After a long period of trying to find his weak point, he finally finds it. The hooligan is scared of rats. In his analysis, Lukas Tischner points out that Grombowitz stresses the impossibility of the overman ever coming into existence purely due to the workings of nature, which is a theme further explored in one of Grombowitz's greatest works, Pornography. And so uh, this part is in bold. Do you think that Nietzsche's overman, the superior species, has even a chance of existing? With Nietzsche saying that the overman is yet to be born in his philosophy, despite its universal truths being so tightly fitted onto one man, Nietzsche himself, would he not have been aware of this impossibility? Uh, I don't think the overman is a um, literal being, is the short answer. And I don't think... Um, it, it. I mean, this is this is sort of the issue with stories like this. You're like pointing to the weak points or the faults of of humans as they exist now, right? That we are human all too human, and saying, "Look, you're still human." And um, I guess I'm like Nietzsche is aware of that, and he he knows, right? He he's he's very aware that we are all still human all too human. Um his his uh, his um assertion of the overman is the assertion of a new ideal something to hold above ourselves which is more human than we are now and to aspire to which is so infinitely beyond um where we are now that it can always serve as that horizon that we can aim towards that is the realignment of our values that story you, you have here by Grombowitz, it reminds me of, there's a book called The Sea Wolf, I think. I forget the author. But it's about a, like, domineering, tyrannical asshole of a sea captain who, um, the, uh, you know, like, lords it over his men. And um, I, the author said as well, it was his attempt to sort of criticize the Nietzschean overman idea. And we see this also with, like, Stephen Pinker, um talking about you know his view of the overman like you know uh being this i don't know like tyrannical race of like literal like superhumans like lording over the masses of you know sheeple or whatever and that that's what nietzsche imagined um now you know obviously he talked a lot about the higher man and did believe in like aristocracy right but that's like nothing new that's that's actually not a it's not nietzsche's idea to have um you know kings and nobility and um you know an order of rank in society that's how human society has always functioned <laughs> right and nietzsche feels that that is like a the natural state of affairs for human beings and human society um and for life itself and you know he didn't Nietzsche didn't come up with how life was going to be organized. He's telling you how he sees it. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think, uh, I don't really, I don't really put much credence into that, uh, sort of counter argument, I guess, because, you know, um, just because someone is afraid of rats or, you know, they're, like they have like some human fault to them or like they still have their own fears. Like, like there's, there's a great uh, part in um, a James Bond novel, Dr. No uh, by Ian Fleming when Bond is captured by Dr. No, who a lot of, a lot of uh, Fleming's villains are very Nietzschean, right? You have Bond as this like representative of like English, uh, English morality. He's the English gentleman who, um, you know, is of, he's like of the intelligentsia to some extent, right? Uh, because he's not just like a secret agent. Um, you know, he's, a, he wears three piece suits and tuxedos and plays, you know, Baccarat at the gentleman's club and, uh, you know, lives a life of luxury. It's really quite, quite absurd. But, um, but I mean, that's all just sort of evidence that it's in Fleming's like, fantasy uh, mary sue character um I, I love these books by the way it's just but you know being honest about what they are um and his villains are often very very nietzschean um they are great individuals who want to like transform the world and who express like 
in long a long conversation and dialogue over dinner, Doctor No basically tells his life story to James Bond and and why he has transcended humanity basically and has become he's like become this like alien sort of figure where he's like bald and he has like these like mechanical hands and um you know he's like doing experiments on people to like put them through gauntlets of suffering to see like how much punishment the human body can endure and all this stuff and like all these weird details about himself where like you know his heart is in the wrong side of his chest and like how he's just like this alien he's presented as this alien type of character who believes he's transcended humanity and basically in so many words james bond is like no you aren't you still eat and sleep and defecate you're a human being right and i think that is i don't know if any of these critiques of the overman on the basis of the fact that like all the examples of human beings we have are still human all too human it never gets beyond James Bond saying that to Dr. No at the end of the day. It's just, well, you're still a human being in the human flesh and you're there, therefore still fallible and frail and faulty in all these ways. And that's true. Uh, I would simply say, I don't think that that's an argument against Nietzsche's overman as an ideal. It's only an argument against um, maybe people thinking themselves to be individually superior to other people. Right, um, and forgetting the fact that they are human and that um, they do have faults and flaws, and maybe you could say that that's like a moral effect of Nietzsche's philosophy is that people often think that. Um, but there are ways to keep yourselves grounded and not to think that, and that is to, um, you know, count, sure, counteract Nietzsche's uh, counteract Nietzsche's. Um, invigorating medicine with a little bit of Socratic poison every once in a while and know thyself, know the ways in which, uh, you are frail as a human being. So you don't fall into that. Like don't manifest that elitism outwardly. And it's notable that Nietzsche didn't and, uh, Theogenes of Megara didn't for that matter. Um, they were, you know, as Nietzsche said, his inner Theogenes's interviews became more harsh, but his outer, uh, you know, um, his outer uh, temperament and his, you know, manners became milder. Okay, so we'll go on to the next question. What, uh, this is a speedy recovery PT who's asking me about uh, what Nietzsche says about recovery. Quote, what does Nietzsche say about recovery? I know you touched on this topic when you talked about seventh solitude. Can you elaborate more on this? What does Nietzsche say about recognizing when to step back so you can recover and come back stronger? Or does he think you should let yourself die for your cause in your first attempt? On a related note, what does Nietzsche think of the role of consciousness in reflecting on your past experiences to improve yourself? Does he see the usefulness of consciousness for that? Isn't that kind of what Nietzsche himself is doing by philosophizing, reflecting on his human experience? So, I mean, that yeah, that's absolutely... uh, usefulness of consciousness i mean i I suppose i've i've often emphasized nietzsche's sort of body over mind or passion over intellect uh positions in his philosophy throughout the podcast um which because it's very important to grasp that um because if you don't uh understand the primacy of drives uh as like the framework nietzsche is working from psychologically some of what he says uh can it creates conf- apparent contradictions and confusions where there don't need to be. That being said, like he doesn't completely denigrate consciousness. I mean, consciousness is a uh, uh, it's a tool, right? Uh, the the telos of consciousness, in Nietzsche's view, is to basically uh, is communication between human beings. And so he looks at what power does consciousness give us? Well, it gives us the power to communicate and organize. And when we look anthropologically, indeed, what we find is that humanity's capacity for organized violence is what led to its ascendancy, right? Um, so consciousness is what brought us that advantage. And so then on the individual level, does there a usefulness of consciousness for reflecting on the past experiences to improve yourself? Absolutely. Um, and that is that is what he's doing by philosophizing. Um the role of consciousness there, though, what we always have to understand is subordinate to the to the where your will is aimed, which is in this case towards the ends of improving yourself. 
And I mean, obviously the term improving yourself is completely uh, relative, right? To what you're, toward what end, what, what, it is, what it is that you consider to be a improved, more perfected version of yourself, um, which is going to be driven by some underlying will or drive and your, whatever your value structure is. And so consciousness is used subordinate to that and understanding that relationship, that rank ordering of the drives above consciousness allows us to understand uh, what we're doing when we use consciousness to take stock of our past experiences and what we've learned and um, what our mistakes have been and uh, where we've succeeded and where we failed and so on and so forth. Um, certainly, yes, uh, consciousness can do this. But what do we gain by sort of putting it in that subordinate position? Well, we realize, for one, that um, there is no universal, rationally derived blueprint for what self-improvement looks like, which might be like the Socratic view, the Kantian view, um, or, I mean, any number of moral systems which might not necessarily lay claim to have derived it from reason, but might derive it from revelation, right? Like any religious system. So with the awareness that that's not what we're doing when we're trying to improve ourselves, and that it is actually at the behest of some will within us, we can therefore ask the question, bring to mind another aspect into consciousness of which, what aspect of myself is setting the value structure by which I am evaluating what an improved version of myself would look like. And is that a will or drive that I can trust to lead me on to some form of self-improvement? Here, I'll give you a little, uh, my hot take on a hot topic, right? Andrew Tate. Um, I don't agree with him being banned and deplatformed. I don't agree with any of that shit. But um, that being said, <clears throat> I don't like Andrew Tate. And a lot of why I don't like him is because I feel like he basically teaches young men to become slaves to their sexual impulses and teaches that as like a form of self-improvement to young men that like what they should strive for is having being able to have sex with a lot of women and um, being able to not allow themselves to be like used financially, but s somehow outmaneuver women in the m dating and mating game or what have you, so that they always come out on top with all the advantages and that they should be, you know, have like a, a harem or stable of women that all are all like lusting after them. And you can have this too, right? I would just quite, I mean, it's, it's exactly things like that where I'm like, I would really question whether like trying to maximize your amount of like sexual encounters and like get the better of the most best number of sexual partners actually is a good thing, right? Like, or whether that's a good thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll tease out what I mean by that. Whether by your own standards, that is a direction that will lead you to continually enhance and improve yourself. And some people answer yes. They say like, well, that's my motivation for hitting the gym and, eating properly and sleeping and taking good care of myself so that I can be attractive to women. And like, we would be foolish to think that that isn't what is driving a lot of why people desire to improve themselves. Right. But, um, I suppose what Nietzsche would have to say is that a more, a higher person, somebody who's truly noble would be able to rank order their different values and harness perhaps that desire to be attractive to women in order to improve yourself while making use of perhaps another will or desire in order to constrain that and keep keep yourself on a path that's not just going to lead to you like you know your sole value in life being promiscuous in sexual encounters and then along the way you like you know like um you know, use and then discard a bunch of other like human beings that you might have had a meaningful relationship with in the endless pursuit of this like um, hedonic pleasure, right? And, uh, and to tie back into the patron question from earlier about sexuality, that's part of my suspicion about like this sexual like revolution or liberation or whatever um, when it's like maximized to the extreme because you get figures like Andrew Tate and the people on the left who really enjoy the idea of like sexual liberation, they don't typically think that like 
because Andrew Tate codes for right wing, right? He skews for right wing. So they don't typically see that as like uh, the fruits of what they have sown, but it is, right? Inevitably, if you, if you completely free the sexual impulse for, you know, all libertinism to take place, you're going to have people like that who want to just like sort of use and discard people. And, um, you know, maybe that's fine with some number of people out there. And that's your morality and you have to suss that out. I'm just saying, you know, be aware of what it is that your, <laughs> your consciousness is useful in helping you understand what will or drive is taking charge there. And once you bring that to your awareness, perhaps it will allow your more noble drives to see that and act in order to take charge of the situation. Right. And, uh, yeah, as far as solitude, um, what Nietzsche's idea of the seventh solitude is, um, is hmm, Nietzsche lays out like a whole um, list of sort of solitudes that one endures uh, on their path as a free spirit. Um, it's not the kind of thing that I think is like any sort of like universal philosophical principle. It's just sort of a, uh, it's Nietzsche sort of laying out, I think, his own spiritual philosophical path and... Um, I mean, the seventh solitude is convalescence, right? Um, but that what comes before that is like going beyond morality and like the abandonment of all like friends and like loss of all of your metaphysical grounding and um, <clears throat> all these things that he talks about. We, you can look at that in the episode on uh, the Overman part two called The Convalescent where I talk about all of that. Um, but... I mean, really the short version of answering this question, and I think the one that most of us will find most useful, is that Nietzsche thinks withdrawing from society at large is a very important thing for a thinker to do um, as this sort of convalescence and recovery, um, sort of from the, the, what would you call it? I mean, the damage that's done to you by involving yourself with the, the common people on a regular basis. He thinks that actually people who are, um, who stand outside of the morality and the conventional thoughts of their age and stand above that are somewhat like poisoned or just made sick by, um, taking all the thoughts and feelings. And, uh, I mean, so like consider the consequences of Nietzsche's views on art and what art, how powerful art can be and shaping our mind states, our emotional states how it has this mimetic power. I mean, if that's true and you have a bunch of common people who have pathological mind states and emotions making their art all the time, and furthermore, not even really, I mean, like a lot of forms of quote unquote art uh, in the modern world come to us through like advertising and come to us through uh, just this bombardment that we have all the time from people trying to like sell things or um, get us to believe something politically or act a certain way politically or whatever the case may be, in addition to all the actual pro art, properly speaking, that is out there. So you're also getting bombarded with images images and sounds and ideas from all of these um, really <laughs> just like basically manipulative sources. Um, and that's truer than ever in the modern world. And so if you actually believe that has a real effect on your mind up to and including, I mean, like even Schopenhauer says, like even reading books, you're like letting other people's thoughts into your head. So you're like constantly being, being bombarded with the thoughts and feelings of others. And we are constantly aware of, um, the judgment, the moral judgment, and just the overall social judgment of others, um, to the point where it's in our heads in the form of conscience with everything we do. And so, Nietzsche literally means you do actually need to re remove yourself from everyone and be solitary for a time in order to just be with yourself, just yourself and your own thoughts and feelings. And that in some sense, like all these other, if you, if we want to go to the, back to the metaphor of like the garden of your psyche, all this junk from outside is like weeds and vines and clover and all this stuff that's just like growing over the natural ecosystem of your mind, of your psyche. And that solitude basically 
cuts off the food supply, the, fu- the fuel for all this other foreign gunk. And then your real thoughts can sprout. Things that are actually belong to you, that you actually have a right to. Um, and so that is really the importance of solitude uh, on the thinker's journey, right? On the free spirit's journey of, you know, um, climbing higher and higher into the heights is that, yeah, occasionally you have to withdraw into solitude and, um, sort of recover and convalesce. But nevertheless, um, you know, uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily realistic for a lot of people in the modern world. And, uh, that's sort of up to fate, right? Whether you have the means to actually withdraw and be solitary. If not, even being aware of the effect of the crowd on your mind and on the conventional morality and judgments on who you are, I think at at least puts you into into a position where you can do something with that faculty of consciousness to affect your um, outlook and keep yourself sort of intellectually cleanly. Um, And then you ask, is Nietzsche's philosophy limited to the individual? Or in other words, how would the world look if the entire world followed his philosophy? Does Emerson's concept of the interpersonal world complement Nietzsche's philosophy? Interpersonal world. I mean, I've read some Emerson, but I have to confess, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Um, I mean, I know how, how Emerson viewed the world. I mean, is this Ralph Waldo to Emerson? Um, so I'll just answer the first two questions that of your second little bracket there. Is Nietzsche's philosophy limited to the individual? No, he has a political and a cultural and a moral project. But how would the world look if the entire world followed his philosophy? I don't think that's what Nietzsche intended. And I think on some level, he thinks that's impossible, right? Because the average person, the common person doesn't have a right to his philosophy insofar as they literally don't have the capacity to understand it. Like they will be unable to comprehend it in its fullness and will get stuck falling down on like one side or the other of this often two sided ways that Nietzsche approaches issues and be unable to um, like see the totality and actually, um, or they'll get like caught on some sort of like dead end bypath of like, um, you know, well, Nietzsche says everything is just open to interpretation. So it's just all every, you know, words are meaningless and, uh, uh, we, there's no morality that's better than any other. And therefore we should just all be nihilists. Right. And it's like, you end up at a place where you're like basically characterizing Nietzsche's philosophy in a way that he himself would reject or, you know, the overman is a literal biological next step for humanity. Um, who needs to be like eugenically produced today. And we need to help produce the overman by like, you know, like culling the weak in our society or whatever, which, you know, like very limited, narrow interpretation of the overman that like in many respects does make you wonder if you actually take that interpretation, like, well, why would anyone want to, if I'm, if I'm literally just, dying now to bring forward some greater human being that's going to be like a literal man that walks the earth like some great leader i would understand why most people would like look at that and say like well that's like a psychotic you know like view of the world um not understanding like that the overman is so much bigger than that right um and so I don't think the uh, whole world can follow Nietzsche's philosophy, and I don't think that was his intention. I think he would want uh, a a select few to, he would expect, and he would hope that a select few would um, interpret his philosophy properly, and that these people would then change the world. That you don't actually need that, everyone to believe things to, to change, or everyone to follow your philosophy in order to change the world. And we've kind of talked about that up to this point but um and furthermore it's like i there is a real danger to people who don't have a right to nietzsche's philosophy following it because it can you know knock out uh the metaphysical foundations of people's worldview which can be very damaging to someone if they're not if they don't have like the intellectual or moral constitution to deal with that um he can disturb people. He can lead people to think. I mean, the most common thing is just people interpreting Nietzsche's philosophy as a right to be an arrogant prick. And um, when, in fact, they don't have any right to be arrogant pricks, right? 
like, oh, I read Nietzsche. I'm, I'm super smart now. But it's like, okay, would, do you actually, are you actually one of Nietzsche's higher men? Are you Napoleon? Right? Because if you're not Napoleon, uh, you being an arrogant prick is totally unwarranted. And quite frankly, Nietzsche never advocates for being an arrogant prick. He always advocated for being polite. And so um, impolite people I, I've seen it on Reddit many times on the Nietzsche forum where people will <laughs> actively be complete assholes and then they will, uh, you know, uh, cite Nietzsche in his immoralism as their license to be impolite. When it's like, okay, well, Nietzsche himself would have thought you were a, like an uncouth fucking savage who doesn't deserve any respect. So, you know. He probably would have thought that about me too in many respects, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I digress. Okay. Well, we'll move on. Uh, elf machine sex magic asks, what do you think of the book bronze age mindset and BAP's interpretations of Nietzschean thought? Where do you agree? Where do you disagree? If you have not read this book, you can easily read in two, three hour sessions with break in middle for smoke break and a snack such as egg with pickle. (laughs) Do you like this? Are, are you asking me if I like eating egg with pickle? Is this a European? Is this is a European person. That sounds like a very like European thing to eat for, to, for some reason. Just knowing how like they like what like a European like style like you know snack is. It seems like a very European thing, like egg with pickle. Because I've never heard of that combination. Um. So uh, okay, no, I haven't read the book. Uh, I've heard a lot about it. I've I've heard people who are like advocates for the 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 whole BAP movement like talk about it. Um and so I don't actually know about his interpretations of Nietzschean thought. Let me let me look him up really quick and see if I can find find him. So I, I've like looked up a couple quotations from the book and uh it, I and apparently he does reference Nietzsche quite a bit. It just it does seem like uh many of the arguments are sort of like uh, almost like a lowbrow summary of what Nietzsche already wrote. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I might like, I don't know if I have like a, a specific, I'd like to see like, maybe, maybe if you could uh, in the next Q and a ask me like about a specific claim he makes about Nietzsche's work that I could sort of like verify or falsify. But like, for example, where he talks about the bug man and, uh, relates that to like the last man. I mean, he's, He's using slightly different language. Um, he's using language that I guess is a little bit more like easily relatable or understandable by the average person because like it's like Bugman, oh, it's like a hive. Like, okay, got it. Right. Um, and that is, you know, very similar to Nietzsche's last man concept. And I don't think he's wrong or off the mark really. Um, it it seems like the writing style is not really my my uh cup of uh, tea so i mean just to be honest but um he also seems to bring up uh, schopenhauer a lot so um you know apparently schopenhauer is referenced more than nietzsche so certainly interesting i don't think i realized there was like as much of a nietzsche influence on brunch bronze age mindset but it's funny because people are like almost uh like a lot of the negative reviews seem to just say like this is just badly written Nietzsche. Although it seems like it's very it's very obvious that some of the dropped like grammatical articles and like style of writing is very intentional. It's like like a a book by a caveman um, almost at times. So I don't know. It's funny. Uh, I I don't know if it's really for me, uh, but you know, uh, I guess this is my invitation to like you find find me a specific issue where bronze age pervert uh interprets nietzsche and i'll tell you whether i think he's wrong or right okay uh curious ad five three four nine how do you interpret chapter 19 book one the bite of the adder um oh 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 okay i was about to say like i we covered that already but that's vision and the riddle that's where uh the uh adder um it's where zarathustra himself gets bitten by an adder right he's like sleeping under a tree and the adder bites him and uh he's like about to leave and uh zarathustra's like well don't go until i thank you my dear friend the deadly viper that just bit me and he's like well you know you're you're gonna die soon uh from my poison and then zarathustra basically says that uh you know uh, like he's just like when did a uh let me just look up the passage 
Um, hold on, I'll like edit this. Okay, when did ever a dragon die of a serpent's poison, said he. Uh, but take thy poison back, thou art not rich enough to present it to me. And then fell the adder again on his neck and licked his wound. Um, the funny thing is, the Zarathustra's disciples ask him, like, what's the moral of the story? And he tells them. And basically the theme of the sermon that he gives them, I mean, he begins with, with bringing up that he's the destroyer of morality and that he is, my story is immoral, right? And so he says, um, uh, th- when, however, you have an enemy, then return him not good for evil, for that would abash him, but prove that he hath done something good for you. So what is Nietzsche, uh, what is Nietzsche doing in that little parable or that little aphorism? He's reversing what Jesus says. Um, well, not exactly re- inverting it. He's just saying, uh, no, don't return, don't requite evil with good, um, that he says that would abash your enemy. So don't, like, don't embarrass or shame your enemy by like transcending the the need to requite harm with harm. But he sort of says later in the passage um, uh, that you shouldn't. Uh, basically, he says like uh, he doesn't like people's cold justice. He says he doesn't like the cold justice in the eye of your judges, um, and that. Uh, he doesn't. You shouldn't punish unless uh, you have the right to punish, and that if it would uh, benefit the person being punished. Um, it's so it's interesting too because that's very similar to what Socrates says at the beginning of the Republic. Um, that punishment that simply harms is actually not just, and that all punishment should sort of all the actions of a good ruler are to improve the people under his lot. Uh, and so, you know, on the one hand, we could look at this as, uh, um, Nietzsche's, um, Oh, and what does he say? And instead of, uh, doing requiting evil with good, he says, prove that the person who's done evil has done something good to you. And so on the one hand, we have sort of Nietzsche's, um, you know, uh, his, his lauding or admiration for the soul that overflows and gives and that even in giving punishment, you could actually um, sort of bless people around you. But furthermore, when harm is done to you, when an adder comes and bites you, um, that there you should accordingly be able to find a way to thank them for it. That um, having an enemy that's capable of harming you in some way is actually a very, um, it's something you should be grateful for um, in the sense that, I mean, if if you have an enemy that's actually unable to harm you, that's not strong enough to harm you, then of what consequence to you is that person? You shouldn't even consider them. And if you are truly greater than them, then you would be lowering yourself by, you know, being concerned with, with them. Um, as, uh, you know, Theogenes says, uh, what is it that, the, you know, only the nobility should compete against the nobility. The idea of competing against, like, the plebeians would be uh, absurd because how can you, like, compete with men who are um, beneath you, right? The political Aegon was limited to the nobility. So in the same way, the sort of the spiritual nobility that Nietzsche wants to call forth um, should basically only compete with people who are actually equal um, or actually of, of merit. And so when, um, you know, the adder, the adder shouldn't be able to kill the dragon. You shouldn't be able to be, um, you know, moved to dis- to dispense punishment as a form of revenge by something that is less than you. And in fact, every, um, you know, whatever injustice befalls you, you should be able to, um, transmute that into some form of gold. Right, and so notice maybe the the way to differentiate Nietzsche's approach is like you would have the sort of like it's funny because it's not this isn't really master morality or slave morality. It's uh, I think Zarathustra does through this sort of bizarre uh, synthesis almost create something new. So the slave morality is turn the other cheek, right? Requite uh, good. Uh, when evil is done to you, the master morality would be something akin to, well, if someone is mighty enough to do evil to me, then I should pay them the respect of returning the favor, right? Uh, And showing my power to them. Nietzsche is sort of saying in a way, um, let all of this, let all of the world, all the experiences that happen to you, um, don't like, let your reaction to it be solely concerned with you, 
Like who cares about the other person? They're just a will or they're just a um, driven, faded phenomena uh, acting out its will on you like every other phenomena, right? If you have that kind of equanimity, like he talks about in Human All to Human, to be able to see a man that does wrong to you like a criminal as no different from like a rampaging wild animal or a thunderstorm, then you're not going to have this need to, um, you know, uh, to punish out of that sense of revenge. And in fact, it's a higher level still from that to say every injustice that's done to me in some way actually improves me. And so this is sort of his revaluation of, uh, good and evil in some sense, is tied into this and why he invokes that he's this destroyer of morality because he does, uh, as he says in his notes, wish on all who are of any consequence to him, great hardship. So when hardship happens to you, recognize it for what it is, something that can harden you and make you stronger. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. That line that's been said a million fucking times, but nobody takes it to heart because it actually means not regarding pain and suffering as a quote unquote evil but as something that to a strong person actually uh, is good for you. And furthermore, then, to recognize things like pleasure and comfort as vices. And the final element is take all the injustice or punishment or evil that happens to you and transmute that into gold. Use it for your own purposes. Um, don't concern with yourself with how to properly respond to the other person. I mean, that may be involved from just like a strict necessity, right? Like if somebody's antagonizing you, you might have to respond in some way um, out of necessity. But in terms of uh, like moral concerns, right? We're beyond morality. So then how do you respond in that sense? Or justice concerns, right? Well, Zarathustra rejects the justice of punishing for the sake of revenge or retribution. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, that would be my interpretation of the passage. Um, the adder, the bite of the adder is the evil and injustice that you will inev inevitably face in your life. And Zarathustra is demonstrating in that how to thank that for coming to you such that the poison of the adder does not kill the dragon, right? Be the dragon. So Peterson says, slay the dragon. Nietzsche says, be the dragon. <laughs> okay. Uh, zero over zero, 101 asks, I've just started listening to the podcast and I'm a fan. My question is about Nietzsche's philosophy and how we might reconcile it with grander institutions in the state. Um, just to interrupt in the middle of the question. We're getting into that a lot next season. But he says, I know his philosophy is intensely linked to the self and, in fact, to seeing the flaws and life-denying aspects of those said institutions. But this can be a difficult philosophy to apply to the world at large in which often cases, states, communities, and societies must make decisions not for the self but for the well-being of the whole. How might we apply Nietzsche's philosophy as something worth interrogating for us humans as a whole? How might we apply it not only to how we live but how the world ought to be? And how do we reconcile some of the perceived selfishness of his philosophy with the need? practicality of decisions that must go beyond potentially even go against his philosophy um since we are going to be talking about that quite a great deal i will partially answer by saying and i have kind of talked about it in this q a with answering other questions um so i will simply say to look forward to more on this but the simple answer is okay one of nietzsche's big insights is that the individual is not a oneness in the strict sense that what you are is a multitude. You're actually in some sense, a community. Um, again, I, I never tire of pointing out the similarities with Nietzsche and Socrates in their thought, as well as their character, which seemed to me to almost be equal to the, um, to the ways that Nietzsche totally rejects Socrates and actually thinks he's one of the worst problems for humanity <laughs> uh, or for like the Western mind. But again, Socrates is to confess it frankly, so close to me that almost always I fight a fight against him as Nietzsche says. So with, you know, the Republic again, Socrates sees that analogy between a well-run state and the individual psyche, and that the way that the individual psyche can be ordered, so too can the state be ordered. And that you can look at corresponding elements in the individual to the social 
stratification or the political stratification of the state and the different functions uh, within the individual to the different functions of the state, right? That there is an analogy to be made there. And Nietzsche believes something similar. Now, the main difference between them is that Nietzsche doesn't think that you can use reason as a rational, voluntarily governing act of free will to order the self um, any more that, than you could use, uh, you could do so, uh, you uh, like appeal to reasonable arguments and, and by that means alone reform the state, right? Politics always involves the use of force. To quote Starship Troopers um, and Michael Ironside's character, when you vote, you are exercising force. And so um, that's what I would say. So, so when we look at that analogy, um, we'll just uh, go. So what Nietzsche's going from the self as a, as a unit to the microcosmic state, right? Well, go from the microcosm of the self to the macrocosm of the polity. And look at what Nietzsche says and recommends for individuals, for individual health and sanity and strength, and apply it to the entire polity as a unit. And, uh, you know, uh, Ibn Khaldun, the, the um, Middle Eastern, uh, North African, I believe, philosopher, who I do want to cover his work, the Mukhadima, in this next season, he has this wonderful concept called Asabia, which is basically the capacity for cooperation within a society, the degree to which it does, your society is coherent and you have a shared sense of value, shared destiny in your society, right? Um, you know, like the extent to which you can even conceive of your state as a unity in any coherent, intelligible sense is the sense in which um, that in itself is a measure of well-being, Right, but then even on that level, you can apply, um, and this a lot of this has to do with um, group level selection as well. Um, a lot of um, biologists uh, have like really disliked the idea of group level selection, but I think that um, it's actually if you look at the evidence and you look at the math, it's actually incontrovertible that group level selection uh, happens, um, and. Basically, the way this would work is even if you have, even if the natural selection mechanisms do not themselves select against groups, right, but are selecting on individuals, the groups that um, are able to cohere in such a way that they preserve and better keep the strength of their group of individuals will endure and then the other groups will collapse. And um, and so, yeah, I would just say um, without maybe getting into any specifics or details of what Nietzsche you know, Nietzsche's ideas are, um, for the individual I would simply say, take what you've seen and what he says about the individual and apply it to the state and see where you get, can go from there. That would be my first recommendation. Relum 777 asks, how does one increase one's will to power? Um, diet and exercise, getting a good night's sleep, <laughs> right? Uh, that's kind of the short answer, honestly. Like, um, the, the first thing you should do is, um, like focus on your physiology and take care of yourself and make yourself physically healthy. That, that is the first thing. And I, it, it's like, you may say that's too obvious and I want more than that, but look, uh, assuming, um, well, I've seen the analytics most, since most of us listening are, are in the West, most of us are not physically active enough and we're not healthy enough. And most of us do not have that under control to those of you who do congratulations, but, um, you know, uh, take your body's a temple, take care of it. Um, and then you'll be amazed how your will to power improves. <laughs> I, I generally hate, uh, that type of phrasing of like increasing my own individual will to power. Like it's like a power level or something. I think that's a very silly way to think, but, I, you know, there's your straightforward answer. Nevertheless, I can work within your, your silly framework. Okay. And then we have fine. The final questions by the ass arrives, uh, beautiful and most brave. He says, hi, I started your podcast about a year ago and it's been a great addition to the books themselves, which I started shortly after my question. Are there any cases where Nietzsche's higher type of man would feel pity 
or at least act in a way commensurate with that feeling, such as lend a helping hand to someone that is suffering. Um, Okay, yeah, I mean, whatever is done out of love takes place beyond good and evil, for one. So um, I think to some extent, like, pity, the pity that Nietzsche is attacking is a moral pity. And nevertheless, because this is a, because this is something that is then beaten into all of society over long generations, all great things uh, on this earth being having to be thoroughly soaked in blood before they can become useful and fully come into being and enter into our conscience and our deepest inner life. So that does exist, but that's, it's like the universal pity, the pity that you feel for all mankind, the pity that you would feel for even a stranger if you saw them suffering or the pity even for an animal. A lot of people feel even greater pity for animals when they see them suffer than people. Um, whereas like, okay, we would say that pity in the sense of like, if your loved one is dying, I don't think Nietzsche's philosophy, um, is actually aiming at like cutting out like your love for other people, motivating you to want the best for them and be sad when they die and, you know, not want them to suffer needlessly or in a way that like wastes them away. Right. Um, and if and if someone wants to argue, which maybe it could be argued that Nietzsche's philosophy does entail that, it should even involve removing all pity, even cutting your bonds of family and blood ties of blood and water, right? I would say to that extent, then, Nietzsche's philosophy becomes not superhuman, but inhuman. And that's just not, uh, that's not natural for human beings to be sociopathic, right? Um, and... So that there is some extent to which, um, when it comes to like love and family ties and, um, you know, even ideas such as like love of one's country and not wanting your countrymen to suffer, I think you can see a way in which pity could be justified. And then of course we have Nietzsche's pity for the higher man, but he does say he has to, you know, excise that, but maybe there is like a more noble type of pity that isn't just based on wanting uh, you know, not being able to bear the idea of others suffering. But um, on the other hand, I do think like as a moral idea or something that like should be encouraged or like seen as an essential part of like a noble person, Nietzsche would not say that pity has anything to do with it. Now they could act in a way commensurate with that feeling, you know, the way that you phrased it. Yeah, sure. They might be merciful or generous, but that would... Uh, it wouldn't be out of a moral obligation. Um, and that would be out of their own desire to sort of give and to be powerful in the inverse way of causing harm. Um, and so he says, if there's room for pity, how might we go about eliminating the bad side of pity from modern day Christianity? Or was Jesus unequivocal on this matter? And if we did, how big of a win would Nietzsche consider that to be? Uh, I have thought about that actually. Um, that this very thing of like that really what Nietzsche's project is, is we need like a new religion to replace um, the one that is the old religion, which has died off or in, is in the process of dying off. And that there's no, um, there's no, there's no means of simply returning to the old religion without remedying the problems that killed it. Right. And it remains to be seen whether we could actually do such a thing, whether it's even possible. Because as I've said on the podcast before, I don't think that belief is subject to the will in the simple sense that you can simply decide like, well, it would really be better if I believed in this religion. It's like, okay, see how that works for you. Um, but, you know, so I have thought about that a lot and that you, you could you create some new form of Christianity? Could you use the same like iconography and characters and even maybe the same canon? And I think, by the way, uh, to give an example of this, like, uh, so one of the ways that you can like take a religion and sublate it in the sense of German philosophy, right? You can negate what needs to be negated, uh, transcend what needs to be transcended while still maintaining and preserving uh, the, you know, like you're all, you're also by that token maintaining and preserving it. Right. And that's by adding 
um, having a, a dual canon, right? So the Old Testament is sublated by the New Testament, right? It, uh, it cancels many things in the Old Testament. It preserves the religion as a whole. I mean, Christians would say so, Jews would disagree. Um, but in that it also transforms it into something new. It, it is the, it's, it's like a new, like, stage of development, right? Uh, in which the old truths do not entirely hold and certain things like the, you know, apparent pitilessness of the Old Testament God are completely reevaluated. In fact, the inverse holds true. Um, and so could we do another, another such thing? And we have an example of this with Christianity in the form of, uh, say, Mormonism, which is actually a very recent development in history. And it adds the Book of Mormon, which is therefore makes Christianity a triple canon. And what you notice happens is that you you retrospectively reevaluate the contents and reinterpret the contents of each book with the coming of the third piece. And you can completely remake a religion that way. I mean, you have a similar thing in like Buddhism where you have like the Pali Canon and the like sutras that are accepted by the Theravadins, but then you add the dual Canon of the Mahayana scriptures and these all reinterpret things so that in some sense, in some of its, forms you have something that's like a completely different religion right um even though it's all classed under buddhism and then you know obviously with islam you have the the quran and then you have the hadiths uh and so depending on which hadiths you want to admit uh into your canon it can affect how you reinterpret the quran and so could you like have like a new rather than than writing a different scripture like nietzsche did could you write like a new christian scripture that would eliminate the bad side of pity from Christianity. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that would look like because, again, I don't know if you can really... I think Nietzsche is correct about his view of pity, and I think it is far more powerful to, um, to completely... Because the problem with the whole pity thing, right, is that it, it's trapped in this utilitarian evaluation of the world where suffering is bad and pleasure is good. And as long as you're still accepting that, that's the issue. And so wanting to have some element of like good, healthier pity where you're not like, you know, taking all the suffering of the world onto yourself, but, but, you know, you have some guardrails so that you don't become like a brutal psychopath, right? Maybe is what we're getting to. Um, I, I think, hmm. I guess I'll just say, I don't know. I don't know he, how you would accomplish that. And I think the, ide- the pity is so pernicious because it always brings utilitarian thought. It sneaks it in there and then that begins to infect your whole system, right? Um, and so maybe you could only achieve such like a glorious synthesis as this in the similar way to the way Greek tragedy creates this synthesis of Apollo and Dionysus of actually mutually antagonistic ideas that somehow in this mysterious way come together in a way that you could only really have in an artistic or religious form. And then in a logical form, maybe impossible to reconcile, right? That yet rather than a union of Dionysus and Apollo, you could have Dionysus and, and the crucified, right? And some new religious form, um, these mutually antagonistic values coming together. Um, I don't know. I don't think necessarily Nietzsche would approve of such things, but I think it's possible that he would. I'm not exactly sure. And you list uh, several um, aphorisms here where you say you, you've done your homework. Um, you have the Gay Science 338 where you think uh, Nietzsche basically implies that he wouldn't um, uh, approve of pity in any form. And then you have some cases where he might see uh, also the Gay Science 338, his friends he references, if you were to witness senseless abuse of animals or perhaps a modern-day chicken farm or slaughterhouse, see the Gay Science 118. Uh, when any perpetual senseless physical abuse that a being is subject to against his will, see the Gay Science 118. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I'll leave people to um, look those up on their own. Uh, gay Science 338 on helping friends, the Gay Science, science 118, pity is appropriation. Or that's his description of what these chapters are. Okay. So uh, that is all the questions that we have. And this has been the longest Q&A. Everything in the podcast seems to be getting longer. I've gone from the 
format. When I initially started this, I was like, oh, the episodes will run from 45 minutes to an hour, maybe. And uh, how's that going for me? How it started versus how it's going. Now it's like my my long-winded, my drive to long-windedness is dominating all of my other drives and my internal community of drives. It's tyrannizing and making itself lord and master, my desire to just talk forever. No, uh, in all seriousness, you know, it's because I have more questions and uh, a lot of them make me want to go in depth. And so to whatever extent that's possible, we have uh, done that. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Politics uh, Season 3 is going to start very soon. All right. Bye. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections the link is in the description or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media thank you for your support